This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 53 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you once again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Homestead Journey My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, we are coming up on the one-year anniversary of the Homestead Journey podcast. Can you believe that? One year of us joining together, journeying towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And for those of you who have been with me Since the beginning, thank you very much for your support. For those of you who are relatively new, thank you. Thank you as well for taking time. Again, as I said, your schedule I know is a busy one. And so the fact that you spend a few moments each week with me here on the Homestead Journey podcast really means a whole heck of a lot. And I really appreciate it. I've got some stuff in the works to celebrate the one-year anniversary, so you're going to want to make sure that you don't miss an episode, not that you would ever want to miss an episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, but certainly in the next few weeks, we are going to start celebrating one year of the Homestead Journey podcast, and I'm going to have some great giveaways, and so very excited about that. Let's jump into this week's Homestead Happenings, and I will bring you up to date with what we have been doing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. So on the Homestead this week, things were relatively slow. It's that time of the year where the garden is passed, canning for me is relatively over, And so I'm starting to just sit back and relax a little bit. Now, there's a lot of preparations for the winter that we have underway. And one of the things that I did this week was take the electric poultry netting and put it away. And let me tell you something, folks. People on YouTube like Justin Rhodes and other people that use that poultry netting just make it look so easy. Now, granted... They're out in the middle of grassy fields, and I am doing this in an area that is partially wooded, and there's a lot of rocks, and it's uneven terrain, but let me tell you something, folks. You get towards the end of wrapping up one of those poultry, and it is heavy, heavier than a dead preacher, as my dad would say, (laughs) but we got that put away. We also had a lot of rain this week, and so that kept me indoors quite a bit. Now, I'm not complaining at all. It was a very, very dry summer, very thankful to get the rain, but obviously doing outdoor stuff, preparing for the winter wasn't necessarily in the cards for the most of the week. And so I spent some time this week tidying up the garage, something that I have just been putting off because folks, I absolutely hate doing that stuff. I will be the first one to admit that my method of organization is, well, a rather chaotic, unorganized one where it's just layers of stuff and I know it approximately at which layer I dropped something so I can dig through it to get to where I need to be. And that's just a growing edge for me. It will always be a growing edge for me. And I I really need to, to buckle down and pay a little bit more attention to being a little more organized on the homestead. But this weekend in particular, I really put my nose to the grindstone, so to speak, and really tried to get some things tidied up and sorted and put away. And so the garage is starting to look very, very nice. I was going to spend some time today organizing the garage, and I was just absolutely tuckered out. I don't know why, but I was. And so I actually fell asleep on the couch this afternoon and it was just some well needed rest. My body was telling me, take a nap. And so I took a nap, it's something I have not done in a long time. And it felt good to do that. And I think every once in a while, we just need to remind ourselves that there's always going to be a to-do list on the homestead. 
And so every once in a while, we just need to take some time to rest and maybe to get caught up on some of the sleep that we've been missing. Once I woke up this afternoon, my son and I did my least favorite my least favorite chore of all homesteading chores. And I've shared this with you before, but that is pig castration. And I had a lot of boys to castrate. This last litter that we have, this is the litter that was born in Vermont and then came back to our farm. There were five males out of the six piglets that I brought back. I've never had it that lopsided before. Usually it's about a 50-50 split. This time it was five males out of the six that I brought back. And so I had a lot of castrating to do. I only castrated four. I'm keeping one back. I had a customer that wanted a boar. And it was actually a very difficult decision for me to make, which is nice because these piglets were so, there was just such a nice confirmation to these piglets that having the problem of deciding which boar I wanted to keep was actually a very, very good one. Honestly, I did not choose the largest boar. I chose one based on the number of teats, and it was a little bit of a longer pig, and also its personality was top-notch. It was a very difficult decision, but uh, hopefully I made the right decision, <laughs> and the customer will be very happy, and this pig will really do a good job of adding to the herd book. This week I also had a friend stop by on Friday and it was just great to sit on the front porch with him and shoot the bull. He came a little after I got home from work. So it was around probably 4.30, quarter to 5. And he and I sat on the front porch and chatted for almost four hours. It was crazy. But it was just so good to sit and chat with somebody and it's been a while because of the whole COVID thing that I've had the opportunity to spend some time with him. And so the opportunity to just sit and chat with Andy was a great one, getting caught up on what they've got going on their homestead and bringing him up to speed on the things that we've been doing here on our homestead. He's actually my buddy that I borrowed the scalder from that I shared with you back in episode 35. The poultry scalder that I use is actually his and it was just great to catch up with him. And again, it goes back to sometimes just taking the time to sit back, relax, and enjoy homesteading for what it is. And to share one with another the trials and the tribulations, the joys and the successes. And it just was a great evening. Finally, I wanted to give you an update on Boris, our new boar. He is settling in very, very nicely. He is no longer doing that crazy hide the food and roll in it thing. So I'm very thankful for that. He's still a bit skittish, but I was able to pet him this week. And so that's definitely a step in the right direction. I'm just trying to really work with him. And when I bring the feed down to him, I spend five or 10 minutes just talking to him. So he gets used to my voice and he gets comfortable being around me. I make sure that I deliver the feed in a pail so that he understands that good things come in pails as part of my training of him to a bucket so that if he does get out, I'll be able to hopefully get him back and not chase him all over my yard for two hours. I think if that happens again, we may have bacon on our hands, but anyhow. <laughs> but he is settling in very nicely. He's not pacing the edge of the fence like he was and I am just very excited about him. So that's what's been going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. On this week's Charting the Course, as promised, we are going to talk about winter watering woes. Say that five times fast. Winter watering woes. It's a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> Call it the WWW of homesteading. Winter watering woes. Now, if you live somewhere down south, this may not be a problem for you at all. And it's one of those things that sometimes when I watch people who are down in North Carolina, South Carolina, or down in Mississippi, out in Missouri, people who 
well, it, it rarely ever freezes, or if it does freeze, it doesn't stay frozen very long. Sometimes I'm a bit jealous of that, I have to admit. As much as I love the changes of seasons, and I've shared that with you, the chore of watering animals in the winter is one that wears on me. And I will be honest with you, I, just kind of in the spirit of full disclosure, <laughs> We have not landed on many great winter watering solutions. Now, some of you may just go ahead and quit listening right now, and I guess that's your prerogative, but I will share with you what we do, and hopefully that will be of help to you. And what my hope is that if you have any great solutions, better solutions than what I have to share with you, well, I hope you will reach out to me, Brian at the homesteadjourney.net, or you can reach me via our social media accounts. We're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, MeWe, uh, Reddit, and the links to all of those are in the show notes. And so if you've got some great solutions that have worked out well for you, I am all ears. But I will share with you today what we have done in the past, what we will be doing this coming winter, and hopefully it will be of help to you. It may simply be what not to do. <laughs> I don't know. But before we jump into winter watering, let me just share with you how we water our animals in general throughout the season. So just as a reminder, here on 3B Farm and Homestead, we raise meat rabbits, we raise meat chickens, we raise turkeys, we have a lane flock, we have waterfowl, so geese and ducks, and then we also have American guinea hogs. And obviously, each one of those have different watering needs. Now, the turkeys, the meat chickens, and the laying hens would all utilize the same or similar waterers. And we don't raise turkeys and meat chickens during the winter. But my guess is that if we were to do so, our approach to watering them would be the same as our approach to watering our laying hens. But this is what we do for each variety of animal that we have. For our rabbits, right now we simply utilize heated rabbit waterers all year round. Now when we were raising a lot of rabbits, not that we raised a ton of rabbits, but when we had more than just the two freeloading does that we currently have, we did utilize the traditional non-heated versions of rabbit waterers but now that we're just down to the two freeloading does, we utilize the heated rabbit waterers all year round. And that's simply because they're so easy to fill. Instead of having to take them out of the, the holder and unscrew them and then fill them and put it all back together, you just fill from the top. And so we like those actually year round. For our chickens, we have a variety of the standard chicken waterers that you find at Tractor Supply or at feed stores, the ones that are red and white. And we have a variety of different ones of those. We have some of the ones that are dome shaped and the bottom screws off and you flip them upside down and you fill them. We have some where the lid comes off and you fill them from the top. We've used the ones that have the black lid that unscrews and the vacuum controls how much water goes into the bottom. I don't care for those, to be honest with you, but we have used those. I think we still have a couple of them around. But we use a variety of different waterers. I'm not really sold on any one of them as being superior to another. We have tried using nipple waterers, and just because of the calcium in our water, eventually what would happen is that calcium would build up on the balls in the nipples, and that would cause them to leak. And so I've really gotten away from using the nipple waterers. I do have some of the cup waterers hooked up to a 55 gallon drum that I have attached in the chicken run, but I didn't get that hooked back up this year. I unhooked it because of the cold weather last winter, and I never got it hooked up again this year. And partly it's because where that 55 gallon drum is, it was very difficult for me to get my hose there to fill it up. And my plan this year was to put up some guttering on the chicken coop to refill that 
55 gallon drum and I never got around to it. So I'll revisit that idea again next year. That seemed like it was working out well, much better than the nipple waterers that I tried putting in a five gallon bucket. We have tried those. We didn't have great success with them, but I know many people have. So they may be something that you might want to look at, but those only really work during uh, the warmer weather. For our waterfowl, we utilize a couple of things. We have a rubber pan next to their feed so that they can eat and wash their bills, which is something that they need to be able to do. And then we also have kiddie pools in each one of their pens. And so they can splash around in that and bathe in that. And I'm sure they drink out of that. In fact, I've watched them do it. Although our ducks like to, I know they're crazy. They like to get mud and then put it in there. It's nuts. You can have crystal clear water in there and five minutes later, it looks like you haven't changed it for five days, which always cracks me up as I go down this rabbit hole. But when I see Instagram pictures of these crystal clear, beautiful duck ponds, and I'm thinking, yeah, they just built that. <laughs> or else I'm doing something really, really wrong here. But that has not been my experience. For our pigs, we have 55 gallon drums with pig nipples or hog nipples in them in several different paddocks. Then in the paddocks that are farther away or in paddocks where I might be keeping smaller piglets that maybe aren't able to reach the hog nipples, we utilize the rubber pans. All of that works very, very well during the summer. And we only have to carry water to a small number of animals because a lot of it we are able to fill utilizing hoses. So we have long hoses that we have stretched around the yard. And so for the chickens and for the ducks and for the 55 gallon drums for the pigs, I refill all of those with the hose and it works out very, very well. I do carry water to a couple of different pigs that are a little bit too far for the hose to reach. And now that the chickens are up on the Ruth stout bed, we carry water up to them. But by and large, we do deliver a lot of water using hoses during the summer. But we live in beautiful upstate New York. And as you may know, <laughs> it gets cold here and it stays cold here. And usually from about the end of October until, uh, it depends on when Mother Nature wants to let go, but into March or maybe even into April, hoses are not an option. They freeze. And even if they don't freeze, they're stiffer than a board. And so it's very difficult to move them around. And so for us during those months, we deal with the winter watering woes where we carry water using five gallon buckets to our animals. Now the rabbit water situation is probably the one that is the best for us. And that is simply because right now we're down to the free loading does. And so I only have two rabbits that I need to worry about. As I said, we do use those winter waters, those heated waters all year round, but we plug those into an extension cord and voila, it's heated. And all we need to do is carry water out in jugs, top them off every day, and they're good to go. But those really aren't an awesome solution either for two reasons. First of all, they're not cheap. I think at Tractor Supply, they're like 23 bucks or 24 bucks a piece. And so that adds up very quickly. Secondly, they come with a very short cord on them. And that's for good reason. Rabbits like to chew on things. And if you had a longer cord, rabbits would have a tendency to eat through that cord. And then you would have fried bunny, which is tasty, but not in that context. <laughs> But then you do have to somehow figure out how you're going to get that connected to electric. And we have had a lot of problems with that. I've actually had extension cables catch fire in my rabbitry. 
I thought they were outdoor extension cords. I, I don't know if they were or they weren't. Thankfully, I was there when they started throwing sparks. And so they're a bit of a pain. I know some people who have a bunch of rabbit waterers and what they do is they bring them in a five gallon pail, they put them next to the stove to thaw out and they just keep cycling them out every day. Sometimes a couple times a day. They will take the warmed rabbit waterers out, they will bring the frozen rabbit waterers in and that's just simply the nature of keeping rabbits if you are keeping rabbits in the winter in the great northeast. Now, I have seen some solutions where people will use a heater and then a pump or a bubbler from an aquarium in a in a cooler and then they'll hook up piping and run that through their rabbitry and the water is constantly running and circulating and theoretically it's not going to freeze but that's something that a is going to require quite a bit of engineering it's going to require uh, quite a bit of uh, thought and it's also something that you're going to almost need to have a permanent rabbitry setup in order to be able to do something like that. For our chickens, we have tried a number of different things. We have tried the heated base and putting a water on top of that. That ended up rusting out rather quickly. I tried building a heated base using a cookie tin with a light. That rusted out rather quickly and it rusted together and it was always difficult to know whether or not the light bulb had blown and it was still actually heating and so my water was freezing over and over and over again. I have tried using a cement block with a incandescent bulb in it and a piece of tile on top of it and again that was something where the light bulb would blow and then the water would freeze. And so last year we simply resorted to having three different waterers and we were just simply cycling them in and out. One would freeze, we'd bring it in, we'd have one that was thawed out, we'd take it out, and then we would have one that was thawing out and we would rotate them that way. One of the things that I am going to try is a heated waterer that Jack Palmer over at the Mindful Homestead he did a review on it. I'll link to that in the show notes. I'm going to reach out to him and just pick his brain again to make sure he still recommends those. And by the way, hey, Jack, he listens to this podcast just about every week. And so appreciate that. Shout out to the Mindful Homestead. Check them out on YouTube. They were on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. I'll link to that episode in the show notes as well. But anyhow, he did an episode about a heated chicken waterer. So I think I'm going to buy one of those if he still recommends it and give that a whirl and see how that works for us this winter. For our waterfowl, what we will do is we will put away the kiddie pools and they will simply have the rubber tubs. What we do is when they freeze over, we flip them over, we stomp out the ice and then we fill them back up. And we do that with the pigs as well. Once the freezing temperature set in, I stop filling the 55 gallon drums and I start utilizing the rubber tubs in just about every paddock. Now with my bore, what I will do is I have the bottom of a 55 gallon drum that I cut off and it's probably maybe a foot and a half high. And so what I will do with that is I will fill that up in the fall and then I have a shovel that I just chopped the ice out of that and usually by about a late January, early February, the ice buildup is such in that I can no longer chip the ice out of it and then I switch him over to a black tub as well. But again, it requires a lot of lugging water throughout the winter. What it also does is it requires us to switch our style of animal management. And I think this is one of the things that kind of gets lost with regards to people who are disciples of Joel Salatin or 
Justin Rhodes, who are rotating animals around on beautiful pasture. I'm not going to say that it's not possible to do that in the Great Northeast, but it is almost impossible to do that in the Great Northeast. I see their methods of running water lines throughout big, huge pastures. That's going to work great in North Carolina, South Carolina, maybe Virginia. That's not going to work very well in upstate New York. Now, I do have a friend that will run a hose out to his pigs and let the water trickle. But when you're on a well like we are, I just don't feel like running my well pump over and over and over again is worth it. If I run that well out, if I burn that well pump out, that's not going to be a good thing. I would rather lug water and change my management style than burn out my well pump. Now, another thing that I could do is I could run water lines out to my various buildings and install frost-free pumps. I have not done that for a couple of reasons. Number one simply is the cost. It would cost a lot of money for me to run frost-free pumps to the areas where I would like to have frost-free pumps. But number two, and maybe this is in combination with number one, is that our ground here is so rocky and there's so much shale that it would beat up a lot of equipment trying to dig trenches deep enough to be able to install water lines to get them to where I want to go. And so for me, I feel like carrying water right now is my best option. Now again, I am all ears. If people have any better solutions than what I am doing, I certainly would be open to hearing them, but I simply have not found anything better than carrying water either in jugs to the rabbits or in five gallon buckets to the pigs or in jugs to the chickens. That's just been our best solution so far that we have found. And so since our solution for winter watering is to carry a lot of water, I do a couple of things. Number one is I minimize the number of animals I have on my homestead during the winter. Part of the reason why I breed for spring litters instead of fall litters is for that very reason. I'm trying to minimize the number of pigs that I'm going to have to winter over. When I was breeding my rabbits, I would try not to have any kind of litters during the winter. I would just try to carry through my breeding stock. I don't get meat chickens in the winter. I don't raise turkeys throughout the winter. The second thing that I do is I try to get my animals as closely concentrated as possible. And this kind of flies in the face of conventional wisdom with people who love the idea of pastured animals. But in my situation, I try not to have to carry five gallons of water in each hand to East Japipi on my property. <laughs> I, I would rather uh, have the animals a little closer than to have to do that. Now, that means that you do have to think about other things like having wood chips and having wood shavings and those kinds of things to be able to deal with some of the other unintended consequences of having the animals a little bit more concentrated than you would rather, well, than you would rather prefer. It means that you're going to have to do a little more shoveling of the excrement. <laughs> Uh, then you might otherwise have to if you were keeping them way out on pasture. But again, here in the great northeast, it just seems like for us that it works better to do it that way. Now, if anybody has any other awesome watering solutions, winter watering solutions, I again, I would be more than happy to hear them. And if they're great solutions, I would be more than happy to share them with the entire world and give you full credit, okay? So reach out to me, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net or reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, 
and share your secrets with me. Give me your name. I am more than happy to promote you if you have great winter watering solutions. But for us, what we have found here in the great Northeast is it really boils down to schlepping a lot of water all winter long. Thus, the WWW, Winter Watering Woes. All right, everybody, I hope you find that helpful. Again, this may simply be a matter of what not to do. I don't know. But if I am the beacon of what not to do and it helps you do something better, I'm all about that. Very happy to do that for you. If you have any kind of questions or comments, again, you can reach out to me. I had a number of people reach out to me this week with some encouraging words, and you have no idea how much that means to me. I really appreciate that. And my goal is to be as helpful to other people on the journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability as I possibly can be. If you'd like to support the show, there are a couple of ways that you can do so. Number one, if you could pop over to iTunes and leave me a review or whatever your favorite podcast platform is, give me a thumbs up, five stars, whatever they allow, I would really appreciate it. Secondly, you can share the show with other people. And I really appreciate it. I've had some people and observed some people sharing the show on some of the Facebook uh, groups and you have no idea how much that means to me. I really appreciate that. Third, we do have a shop over at the homesteadjourney.net slash shop. It's a list of affiliate links over on Amazon. These are things that we use here on the homestead. If we don't use it, if we don't like it, it doesn't make the cut. It's not on there. So those are things that if you were to come to 3B Farm and Homestead and you were to poke around, eventually you would find them or something very similar. There are a couple of things like the fisherman's table that we use for our butchering that they don't offer the exact model anymore, but I found something very, very close. As always, the music on this episode was provided by Audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.